Hello, my name is Shaheen. I'm with Lux Capital. Um, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about venture capital and uh, about starting companies in the technology space, especially in electrical engineering, in fields relating to electrical engineering. Um, and each gave a, a background on me. Lux Capital, uh, we're investing for a $200 million fund now. We've been around for a little over 12 years. We've invested in almost 30 companies over the course of that period. And uh, I joined in 2007, and since I joined, I led up two uh, semiconductor investments. I'm on the boards of a couple of our semiconductor and energy companies right now. And I'm spending a lot of time looking into the general energy, electronics, robotics, artificial intelligence, and healthcare IT spaces as well. So uh, since our time is limited here, I'm going to power through this. If anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free to interrupt me, and I'd be happy to provide some more color. So hopefully today we'll talk about what VC is, how VCs go about making their investments, and I'll give you a couple of examples of venture-backed companies. So first question, what's VC for maybe the one or two of you who haven't heard of VC in this room? Um, capital invested in a project which, which there is a substantial amount of risk uh, in a new and expanding business. So, you know, just some more color around what venture capital is. Typically, when anybody refers to VC, they're referring to a venture capital fund, which is a limited partnership here in the middle of the slide. Um, funds for the, for, the, uh, for, for this, the actual money for the fund comes from what's called limited partners. Uh, these are people like the Stanford Endowment, like the Harvard Endowment, pension funds, corporations, um, other entities that have large amounts of money that they'd like to invest uh, and put to work. They take a small fraction of that and put it into very high risk assets. That's uh, venture asset classes with venture capital being one of them. Now this fund is managed by a, a management company. Uh, many of these are the firms that you've heard of. Kleiner Perkins is an example up the street here. Foundation Capital as, as well. Lux Capital, also an example, which is the firm that I'm from. Uh, these management companies manage the funds uh, which invest in individual startup companies. And these are typically C-Corps. Uh, so every fund may have 10, 20, 30, 100 uh, uh, startup companies uh, included in it. And uh, of course, there's cycles. So you hear of fund one, fund two, fund three. So these refer to the limited partnerships uh, that are formed uh, from which these individual investments are made. So any questions on this slide? OK. So the actual management company consists of several entities. There's the general partners who are financially responsible uh, for the money in the fund. Uh, this is the general partnership. They normally hire associates, myself being one of them, uh, to help make the investments, to help manage the investments, to help with raising money for the fund. So we help with the day-to-day -day activities of the fund. Then there's venture partners that are brought on on a part-time basis that are formally affiliated with the fund, who help bring optionality for the fund, help introduce new entrepreneurs, uh, provide guidance on the strategy, as well as advisors. So this should give you a sense of you know, who, who the players are within an individual management company. So here's a, a quick little um, uh, statistic on, um, on, on the amount of money that's gone into uh, startups from venture capital over the past several years. You see a massive peak back in 2000 when over $100 billion uh, went into venture capital. Fast forward out to 2007, um, you know, we had a, a little uh, local maxima over there. And then you see it, you saw it drop. Um, and right now we're pretty much on track for about $26 billion uh, uh, of venture uh, capital money going into startups uh, this year. This slide should give, you, should give you an idea of the breakdown as to where that money is going. We're seeing almost a third of that money uh, going into software. Uh, we're seeing less money going into the more hard technologies, which I'm sure a lot of the guys and people in this room are, are interested in. Uh, you know, in, uh, industrial and, and, and biotech and med devices are, are, are obviously lower than they were before. And we're seeing more money going into software and, and media. But we're going to focus more of our time today talking about more hardware-oriented technologies and companies. So, you know, the question here is, you know, how do VCs go about doing their jobs? Um, so the question is, you know, how do we evaluate investments? So the diligence process is really understanding what we don't know. Uh, we try to understand the risks associated with making investments, and we try to understand how we can be rewarded uh, by, by taking on these risks and hopefully overcoming them. So I'm going to talk about the individual components of risk, but these risks can include technology, as many of you may be aware of, 
market, future financing, competitive sort of uh, 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 pressures, and, and whether or not you can really have the people that would make this company a reality and, and make it successful. So you know, how much money is needed to get to where the company needs to go? And at the end, how well would you be rewarded uh, for taking on these risks? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some, some of the elements of, of, of the risks that go into funding a new startup. So one big one that a lot of you probably are aware of is, is technology risks. So you know, first question, is this technology even going to work? And if it does work, can you take it from a bench scale and scale it up to a commercial scale? Um, and when I say scaling up, it means scaling up performance, bringing down the cost, and fitting it into existing industrial processes. And many people tend to discount the, the, uh, the importance of being able to get a technology or a process to work within existing processes and within existing settings. And I'll talk more about that later. So, you know, again, you know, can we, can we overcome the, techno the, the technological challenges with bringing a new technology to market or making a new company successful? The second, the second risk is around the market. If, you were to, if you're able to prove the technology and introduce a new product, you know, will the market care? Will the market buy? Is this a growing market? Um, you know, where is the market window? These are all big questions that a lot of people probably you know, don't spend as much time on as they should. Uh, the reality is that there's a lot of great solutions out there. There's a lot of great technologies out there. But more often than not, we see markets not willing to pay for these solutions, not willing to attribute value. So it's good to know at the onset, who's the customer? How much are they willing to pay? How important is this pain point? How quickly will they switch over? How much time do we have to, to actually start uh, executing on this opportunity? And then the second big question is competition. So the competition can come from other small companies. It can come from large companies who have big R&D budgets. Um, it can come from other inferior even alternatives to the solution that you're trying to bring to market. So competition obviously is a big one. And then there's the reward. So if we go ahead and overcome all these challenges and risks, how will we be rewarded? Uh, how will we as an investor be rewarded? And obviously the, the investor reward is in the form of probably you know, two outcomes. One is the company being acquired. Uh, so uh, a lot of people think that if I simply prove a technology, then Broadcom or Qualcomm or Applied Materials or one of those guys are going to buy my company for hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, and um, uh, I'll be on my way. But the reality is that uh, a lot of these people are looking for, for deals and, are want, and want to spend for, you know, pennies on the dollar to acquire new technology. So the reality is that you have to make sure that what you're creating, the company is going to be a strategic fit for these companies, meaning that they'll be able to provide an access, uh, providing these big companies an access to a new market that they're not in today. Uh, for example, Broadcom bought up a bunch of wireless companies back in the early 2000s because they didn't have a wireless business. So companies, for example, like Innovance became Broadcom's wireless business at a time when they didn't have a uh, well, at a time when they were focused on the cable modem business, for example. So, you know, better positioning amongst their competitors, better economics on their current product offerings and business. So really, you know, for M&A to really become a reality, it's a one plus one equals three type of um, uh, expectation. And then there's the, uh, the public offering, which is very, very rare and is something that um, you know, many uh, venture capitalists and startup uh, uh, founders shoot for. Um, but it's not something that, that really is, is, can be realistically expected because uh, the IPO markets aren't as hot as they probably were before uh, 10 years ago. So you know, the reality is that public, uh, the public investors pay for a company based on their confidence in the company's future earnings. So what drive future earnings? It depends on the business that you're in. For a semiconductor company, for example, it could be revenue, you know, margin on that revenue, it could be future design wins, and the pipeline at that company. You know, for a drug company, it could be having something in the clinic, you know, a blockbuster cancer drug, uh, you know, vaccine or something um, uh, you know, in the clinic, close to being put on the market, that can give you a good sense of there being future revenue and margin at the company that the IPO markets would invest in. And then in the case of energy, it's having a technology that's been proven you know, at a sort of pilot scale um, you know, where a large developer would be willing to spend, help you, you know, spend hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, build a plant that puts out some kind of commodity that would be advantaged economically and, again, secure some kind of future uh, source of revenue. So again, the reality is that public offerings are lucrative, though they're rare. And one has to be really uh, cognizant of what the drivers are behind them. 
So this should kind of give you a sense of you know, who VCs are, you know, what they do, again, trying to understand, you know, knowing what they don't know, trying to see how they would get paid for taking on a certain risk on a new venture, and then uh, basically helping that venture succeed. So you know, now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about you know, the process of coming up with a new idea and trying to think through the process of turning this into a company and getting it funded and taking it to where it needs to go. First of all, are there any questions so far? Yeah, so yes, go ahead. Sure. So that's a very good question. I was hoping to talk about this. So, uh, and I'm glad the question was asked. The question is, what's the hit rate? Uh, the reality is that if you take a step back and think about what the people who are putting money into venture capital firms are expecting. So if you look at, for example, if you put yourself in, in Stanford's shoes, the Stanford Endowment. So the Stanford Endowment can put money into the public markets. They can invest in stocks, uh, index funds, and maybe get 5 or 6% per year. So if they're taking the risk and taking on the illiquidity, meaning that their money is going to be locked up for the next 10 years in a venture capital firm, then their expectation is to return something on the order of 20% on their investments. And for, you know, for a fund overall to generate a 20% IRR, then the expectation is that every single investment has to make at least 10 times the initial investment. So, but the reality is, to your question, that that doesn't happen every time. So you know, out of every 10 investments a venture capital firm makes, the reality is, after every investment is made with the expectation that everyone is going to be more than 10x, maybe one or two generate that kind of, you know, that's a big maybe. You know, maybe you have one or two Facebook, Google, you know, type outcomes. The rest become, you know, maybe three or four kind of, you know, to get most of your money back, and the remainder are going to be losers, most likely. I mean, that's, the, that's what the statistics show. And the reality is that you see less and less of these huge home run type venture profiles, which begs the question, if you're a larger fund, and you need to generate a 20% IRR, how many you know, home runs are there happening every year overall? And you know, what's the likelihood of you being the bigger fund investing in every single one of these to be able to generate that kind of outcome? Which is why we're seeing more firms that raised massive funds you know, back earlier in the decade now raising smaller funds for this because of this unfortunate reality. Does that answer your question? So that might be a long-winded answer, but um, uh, any, any other questions? Okay, so so um, you know, a little bit about the process here. So you know, again, going back to the previous slides, uh, you know, startup comes and pitches. VCs perform their diligence. They understand, try to understand the technology, understand the market, understand the challenges of the business, understand you know if the business is successful. You know, what kind of comparables are there uh, that point towards how much they'll get paid for this investment? You know. How much more money is this going to need? You know, they get all these questions answered, and then they offer a term sheet that provides a basic outline as to you know, what kind of a stake they would get in the company in exchange for the money that, that they've put in. You know, different things I'll, I'm not going to go into right now because of time, but I can go back to this later if anybody wants to learn more about just the, you know, kind of the terms under which VCs invest.